Uh, so I was reading over your your form uh, leash reactivity. Is that correct? It's more dog reactivity. He's very reactive to other dogs, particularly our neighbor's dogs. Okay. He recently bit one of our neighbor's dogs. Okay. Uh, he got out of our back fence backyard and went over and they have two dogs, one of which is a standard uh, unfixed Onion. standard uh, poodle. Yep. And then they have a smaller one um, and he went after the smaller one. Um, Punctures? Yes. Okay. Broke a, Broke a oh, bone in the bone. dog's leg. Oh wow, lots okay. Lots of yeah. Lots of uh, that that pills. Lots of that um, Can you kind of uh, let me know, like how did it happen? How did it play out? Um, I was, we were in the yard and I was, you know, working and I went through the gate and had my hands full, kicked the gate, it bounced. It he was latch. not on any lead. He wasn't right? on any kind mm. of lead. It bounced. I turned to shut it and I didn't know that they were out, mm -hmm. but he had seen them mm -hmm. and they, she was walking their small dog who is fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and he just ran. Okay. And I ran after him, but by the time I, you know, she had the leash, she was like screaming, he was, he was, um, you know, barking and tussling. Mm -hmm. And we got him in, we got him separated, we got them in, and the little dog was limpy. And then they, they took him in that evening, and there was a broken old number, I think is what they said. Okay. And uh, there's a two I see. Okay. So So you're in the yard, um, go to close the gate, gate bounce is open, neighbors walking by and he slips through the open gate. He went through the open gate and went two houses down to yeah. find them. Yeah. He saw it's, them, it's yeah. them from the backyard. the from the because our fence is like iron, you can see through it. Sure. So he had seen them out their backyard, like walking that way. I see. Had um had you seen anything like that before from him? He, he, he's very reactive every time. They come out, they walk their dogs out, they have a side door. And so they come out right where our back fence, we have a side yard. Mm -hmm. So it comes right to that, where the property lines are. Mm -hmm. And he, if, if he's out, he'll run and bark furiously mm -hmm. at, at the fence line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Even if they come out without the dogs, it got to a point where he, when he hears the door, yeah. or in the mornings, like he'll be in, we'll even sometimes be sleeping, and he'll he'll lift his head we'll up and start whining. We'll do this weird thing that he just did now, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. when that dog was close by. And I'll look out the window, and they're walking by. I like see. He's got his sensitivity. To yep. Alert. Um, it's not every dog. It's just those dogs. Other dogs, and he does exactly dogs what like he did. That. Just where he looks and like a little yeah. bit of a whine. Some he used to be much more lungy and barky. Than these okay. The other dogs. He's um, a better at that. And I saw that, like you did puppy training, and then you did eight private classes. I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And was the, were those eight private classes for reactivity? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what would you yeah, say. Yeah, they yeah. were. Yeah, it was I mean, the same called, issue. Yeah, yeah, we called same someone, issue. and he, we've been working with him. We've been happy with them which just that this happened and we felt like we needed to try something, try different. something different okay may I ask um what did they have you do when you did was it like food-based training was it prong collar no, no it was food-based training primarily and spray uh bottle. okay he used spray bottle, spray yeah. bottle which he re he does respond to. He okay stops if i am there and i spray him. okay so i i actually have all this stuff i carry it in a waste pack when I walk in. Sure. But it's if we're out in the yard, and I, I mean, I just don't, I can't stand the barking at the fence. Mm -hmm. It's just very disturbing to hear all yeah. the time. And and I can't always get to him with the spray bottle. Correct. So, so the neighbor, like really the last piece of this, the neighbor whose dog he bit has now asked us, anytime he's in the backyard, they want us to put him in a muzzle. Mm. Um, or anytime we walk out our front door to take him for a walk. They're concerned that he's going to get loose and attack their dogs, mm -hmm. and so they they want us to put him in a muzzle. I see. Sure. And we've said we'll think about it. Okay. But we're not. We have done a few. We've we put we're not some, sold on that idea. We put some privacy, like screening through the fence, which mm -hmm. has helped a little bit. He mm -hmm. didn't see quite as much. Mm -hmm. And we have when 
when he's not actively, if we're playing with him in the yard or he has other dogs come and mm -hmm. play with him in our yard, then I'll leave him off. But if we're just, if I'm just working in the yard or he's just out there, mm -hmm. which he doesn't do much on his own, we started staking him and putting him on the I see, sure. So that just in case, yeah. he can only go so far. Okay. So. Uh, try, and also when we walk him, because he got away from me, he's gotten away from me um, just when I've been leaving the house mm -hmm. and I had the leash in my hand mm -hmm. and the neighbors were walking, he, he, would go. he got loose and nothing happened, but he got loose. Yeah, so now I do a uh, waste, we both have been doing a waste <laughs> pack and just hooking him up. Sure, to secure him. Yeah. I gotcha. Okay. Um, may I ask um, the apprehension with the muzzle? I mean, it's purely emotional. Okay. Well, uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I, I feel like he, we can't, he can't play in the yard if he's got the muzzle on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as far as like active play time, I'm not going to have him. I want him to be able to throw toys and throw ball mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Okay. But mostly I think it's emotional. <laughs> like it's just sure, really I mean, it typically hard, is. hard to see him in it, and I feel like if we're walking him around with the muzzle, other people are going to think this dog is really dangerous. Sure. I mean, that's usually, you know, it's, it's like 50 50. <laughs> you know, like some people, like, oh, like, uh, here's an owner who's like responsible in right. keeping their dog muzzled. And right. then there's the others, like, oh, that's a dangerous dog. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's like you never Probably know. a large portion of people who don't think about it at all. <laughs> and you also get that, right? They're like, okay, dog yeah. in a muzzle. You know, yeah. like me, like, I'm, I'm a trainer, uh -huh. but I see a dog in a muzzle, I'm like, all right, like, all right, uh, yeah. could be dog human. But I'm gonna just keep distance. But I'm like, oh, that's a dangerous dog, right. you know. But you're correct in the sense that when I have my clients and I tell them, like, you know, you're gonna have to muzzle condition your dog, what have you, almost always is purely emotional, mm -hmm. uh, or they, they they don't like the way the dog looks or whatever, you know. Um, I don't think that your dog needs to be muzzled. I was just curious as to uh -huh. why. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, no, I recognize that it's a it's a definitely. I mean, it, when I first started thinking about it, it made me cry. Now we have someone loaned us a muzzle and we've uh -huh. worked with him. Nice. You know, we've like put cheese in it and tried to, we got it on Tried him. to acclimate him to yeah, it. Yeah, we got it on him once. Okay. He didn't seem to be disturbed by it, but it was hard, you know. Yeah. But we, we tried, we didn't want to dismiss it. We want to be responsible. Mm -hmm. But. Um, it is wise. Mm -hmm. It is, it is a good tool to have in your back pocket, mm -hmm. you know. So like I've had clients where I'll tell them, I highly recommend you walk this dog on the muzzle um, in the beginning until we get to a spot where we feel comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. And then usually I'm met with a little bit of resistance, so I'll tell them, okay, let's do this. Have the muzzle on you just in case so that it's there if you need it, right? And then in some cases, the owner will find like, okay, I do need to muzzle my dog. And then once we get past it, we can move past the muzzle. And in other cases, it's just there and then we don't ever really fully need it. Um, but, uh, but it's good that you, as you said, didn't dismiss it because it is just another tool in the toolbox, okay? Uh, when a dog is muzzle conditioned, it allows us to push for even more. You know, I get a lot of antisocial dog aggressive dogs, and if they're not muzzle conditioned, we're not gonna do any kind of socialization because there's just too much liability there, you know? So, and then plus for the owner, um, they tend to get a lot of anxiety, like what happens if things go south, and like, and the muzzle helps alleviate a lot of that stress yeah. because it's like a barrier. I won't take him to the dog park. She will. Mm -hmm. no, I'm, I mean, I'm not considering. I think I'd be more receptive to taking him to the dog park if he was muzzle conditioned mm -hmm. and wearing a muzzle. Mm -hmm. Just because I find it too stressful. Mm -hmm. We live in Evanston. Evanston people are nuts about their dog, mm -hmm. and they're kind of nasty. We've frankly. had some. Yeah, I've had some nasty. If he gets a little cameras. mouthy with somebody, they're nasty. Mm -hmm. And so I just don't want to deal with that. Sure, I gotcha. Um, I've had it too. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, nothing new to me. Um, up, 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 up. Oh, so so that's a good point. So you go to the dog park, mm -hmm. right? Any issues are there? No, just that he play. He loves. He likes other dogs, and he wants to play with them. Mm -hmm. But he's very react. He can be reactive, and he comes in a little red hot. Mm -hmm. So, and he's ma He does the a lot of the play with the mouth on mm -hmm. the neck. You know, it looks like he's biting. Yeah, and some he we found some matches for him where owners are and I'll, I follow him around with the spray bottle mm -hmm. and I tell people if you see him playing in a way you don't like please tell me mm -hmm. you know I try and I've met people who are like 
Oh, they're that's dogs. just the way they fit. They're, that's, yeah. they're dogs. That's how they play. Yeah. They'll correct each other. Yeah. And then I've had other people that have said, your dog doesn't belong at this dog. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, what? we don't go, yeah, yeah, we don't go Trail. real often. He do, he's gone to daycare, okay. not on a regular basis. We use it regularly, but every time I pick him up, uh, is there any problems? They always say, oh, no, he's great. Mm. He's one of our good dogs. Okay. Like, he loves to play. They always say that. He loves to play. He's got boundless energy when it comes to other dogs. Okay. This shaking here, uh, is this normal for you to see up in Yes, he's have... been doing that since I brought him home as a puppy. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so I have some good news. Uh, the good news is uh, I don't deem your dog to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know why that whole interaction happened? The, with the, with neighbors? the neighbors? Well, we assume it's that it's territorial Correct. and they have a dog that's not fixed, which probably... They can, but not really. Uh, I mean, dogs can dogs can smell hormones. Right. You know, uh, I, I think they can smell a, a female in the heat like a mile away, mm -hmm. like something like that, something crazy. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm gonna give you an example of a client that I had. Um, they had a, a pit bull that they rescued. Uh, the pit bull had played with the neighbor's dog countless times. Okay, and then one day they opened the front door, and the neighbor's dog happened to be in the yard. Mm -hmm. Okay, their dog beelined outside the house, ran behind the house, attacked the neighbor's dog. And they're like, Jesse, we don't get it. They pay played countless times yeah. prior. I said, it's because when they played, it was, um, there was like a ritual, you meet up, right? Mm -hmm. Or like everybody was around, it wasn't a surprise. Mm -hmm. I was like, when you opened your door, the dog knew there was a presence in the yard and it just went into territorial mode, went and it just happened to be the neighbor's dog, okay? Um, Another, same dog, another instance, it was the wife's uh, grandfather. Walked in from the back garage, same exact thing. Opened the front door, dog beelined out, bit the grandfather, okay? And when they told me, they're all like, our dog's aggressive. And I said, your dog's not aggressive. Your dog is hyper-territorial, okay? And in my, in my opinion, I'm like, technically those things are valid in the animal world because they're thinking, hey, this is our yard. You're just here. So imagine if you walked into your yard and your neighbor was in your yard, yeah. right? You're like, why are you in our yard, right? You wouldn't just go up and attack them, but you most likely have some kind of like, well, why are you neighbor. here? You know, <laughs> yeah, depends on the neighbor, right? So, um, or if you think about it, let's say you wake up and your neighbor's in your house, 12 o'clock at night, definitely gonna have a problem there, right? That's the dog world, okay? So what happened was, you know, you're in your yard, he shifts into territorial mode, right? Unfortunately, happened to have a window of opportunity and what happens is when the dog gets out of the threshold, it's like um, they're zoned in on this emotional state or this mindset of territorial, like I got to eliminate the threat and just went to pursue, okay? It was a small dog, makes sense why the small dog's leg was broken. Yeah. Um, so I think it was just what I call all the wrong things at the right time. Um, because if your dog was truly like aggressive or anything, you would not be going to the dog park. Um, you, you would not even want to take your dog there. Like it would be constant, like this dog is super stressful. Yours is very context-based. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, so consistent with our yeah. experience too. Yeah, so that's, that's the good thing because it's, it's, it, we know within a certain context to expect certain behaviors, which can be addressed. But then also, um, I don't see any reason for your dog not to be at the dog park because that's a community setting, mm -hmm. right? Now, the red hotness, the like coming in and like heavy to play, uh, like super heavy player, right? Uh, yes, dogs play, they're very mouthy. Like I have a pit, um, she's a tank. When she was, she's 13 now. When she was a young pup, two years old, whatever, and I used to take her to the dog park. I used to get the same thing, because she was a growler, she'd yeah. show teeth. Yeah. She was he playing. She a bad park, you know? like it sounds fierce. Yes, but they're playing. Yeah. But you get the soft people that are just like, oh my God, you know, and it's like, well, this is how dogs interact, you know? Yeah. Uh, there's some people that just don't understand dog behavior. Now, you can always disagree with stuff. Mm -hmm. If the mouthing at the neck makes you uncomfortable we can correct that that's mm -hmm. not a problem mm -hmm. we can tame him so he can play to a degree so i always tell people you want to keep it to a four to a five you never want the dog to go over a six to a ten mm -hmm. that's when things tend to happen so it's kind of like with children like in high school <clears throat> i remember we used to play a game called slaps have you heard of that yeah. and then somebody would slap too hard next thing you know you had a yeah. fight yeah. yep but it started this play uh -huh. same thing for dogs they're mouthing yeah. starts this play somebody bites a little too hard now we have a fight okay but if we control that stuff um, it won't lead to that. So like I have my own facility 
Um, we have as many as 70 dogs a day. It's a quiet kennel. There is no excessive barking. There is no whining. There is no crazy, heavy playing, constant playing, 24-7 type stuff. It, everything's structured. Dogs are on treadmills, dogs doing duration work, dogs playing, right? All coexisting quietly, okay? Because we put a limitation to everything, all right? We don't let dogs go over a four because when they go to five to a 10, that's when things happen, okay? At a dog park, most people don't do that, okay? Or don't have the ability to do that. So uh, the people that say the dogs will correct themselves, they're completely right. Um, I understand where they're coming from. The problem that I have with that mentality is some dogs don't know how to correct correctly. They overcorrect. Where you like, it's a correction, but to actually bite a dog, right? So, in their world, it's completely fine. In our world, we have vet bills, right? If there's an infection, we have liability. We have all these other things that make it a bit more complicated, right? So I understand where they're coming from, but it's always the humans in charge of the dogs, so that things never get to that degree. Does that make sense? Yeah. So. Uh, I'm assuming before reaching out, you did research on how we, how I train, the methods that I use, and okay, everything. So you use the e-collar, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. Which we've not used. I someone gave us one. Sure, that I'll they take a look got, at it. But it's probably not. I know it's not the kind that you use. Sure. So it's just a friend of mine that bought it for her dogs. And never decided not to use. Brand it. new. <laughs> yep. Yes. Yep. So this is a good brand. It is okay. a good brand. Uh, the issue that I would have with this, and I'm okay with you starting with it. Um, is this is meant for a 35 pound dog and under. Oh. Okay, <laughs> mini educator, oh, okay. okay? So okay. your dog looks to be about 40 to 50 pounds? Oh, he's it's about 55 to 60. 60. Okay, yeah. so he's over the threshold of this, yeah. okay? Yeah. Now the other thing that we take into account is a dog's emotional state. Your dog is very anxious right now, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So one, we have the physical size, but then we have the emotional state. And typically to override these things, we need more power, okay? So e-collars are uh, tiered. So with the brand that we use, we use Dogtra. Uh, we have high, medium high, medium, medium low, low, okay? So like I had a dog earlier that was uh, 13 pounds. She's on a low power collar, okay? I have a dog that is only 20 pounds, but the intensity of her reactivity is one of the worst that I've seen in the past few years. She's on the high power collar, okay? Because I saw it, like we could not have a conversation. The dog was so reactive, okay? Uh, so she's on the high powered collar because I knew even though the dog was 20 pounds, the behavior itself was gonna need a lot of power, okay? So, uh, the drawback to this is if we started with this, right, is if we end up having to deal with the reactivity or the anxiety, you could be capped out on this and it will have no impact on your dog, okay? So then I would turn around and say, you need to upgrade yeah. your collar. And then we've essentially wasted a class or two, okay? I don't, I don't, I wasn't, I just thought I would bring it so you could yeah, see Yeah, no, I'm glad that you did. I did see on your website the dog truck, yeah. was a different one. Correct. You know, but the other obviously issue, we never use it. We've had it like six months and never okay. used it. Okay. So. Uh, the other issue with this brand that I saw in the beginning, so when I first started training 12 years ago, I used to use this brand because uh -huh. I could order collars from them um, individually. So if I had a new client sign on, I could buy one collar, they would send it next day, and I'd have it for my client, uh, which was really nice because I didn't have to commit to an inventory. But I had, uh, I remember I had like five reactivity cases, and they all got worse. Okay, and the only thing that I could think of was the collar. So I switched to Doctra, and then everything smoothed out, everything was fine. So my theory is this particular collar, the way the stem is delivered, uh, is a bit sharp and I feel like it pushes the dog more than it pacifies them, okay? That's just my personal opinion and experience. And I've used Doctra since and never really had an issue, okay? And I'll let you guys know which model and make yeah. that I would recommend okay. for you. So, um, yeah, so the good things about the territorial stuff is it's really just teaching your dog there's no need to be that way in certain contexts, okay? Now, dogs can learn, for example, he can learn not to bark at the neighbor. He can learn not to bark at that specific neighbor's dogs. But then other people that you don't care for, that you don't like, like you want the dog to bark, we don't correct them. So then he learns, okay, these people here, don't need to worry about them. These people here, I can bark at. Because there is security there, right? Now, if, you're, if your um, opinion is, I just don't want my dog to bark, we can do that as well, okay? I let the owner choose. That's your opinion. That's my opinion. Yeah. He likes that he's like guarding the house. Yes. When I mean, somebody walks by, he runs and barks. Yeah. There's security, and I'm not against security. Uh -huh. Okay. But what we want to do is control oh, security. So okay. So when once we once you have the control and you realize how easy the control is, 
you uh, at that point you'd be able to make a more kind of informed decision because you're like, wow, Jesse was right. Like when I want him to stop, right. he stops now, right. right? I don't have to chase him with the bottle because I have a I have a remote right. that ties me to him up right. to a mile. Right. Okay. So once you have that confidence and control and you see the progress, you might change your mind and go like, you know what, I actually don't care anymore, yeah. okay? Yeah. Or you can decide, nope, I still want this, the dog not to bark. And then I go, this is how we do it, okay? So, um, so is this, this isn't, I just want to confirm what I'm hearing. This is an issue that you think you probably can certainly make better. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this isn't the first dog. Okay. So the dog I told you before, yeah. it took me one class. Okay. Okay, the dog's video is actually on my YouTube channel. The dog's name is Lake. Okay. It's a pit bull. You'll see uh -huh. uh, her. So if you go to my website, caniperspective.com, yeah, yeah. if you go up a little bit, you'll see a video with a picture of a pit bull kind of smiling with mm -hmm. the sun. Mm -hmm. um, and it says like one class turnaround, blah, blah, blah. That's yeah, a good video to watch because you see how the dog arrives. Mm -hmm. And I explain the training. So it's, you're not watching the training. You're watching me explain the training. Mm -hmm. And then I use clips, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and then you see how the dog came in. And she was reactive to everything, both me, my staff, and dogs in my facility. And by the end of the class, she was calm, okay? So uh, it, that's a good video to watch. It's about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and it's all about uh, leash reactivity, but also that particular dog is the dog that bit the grandpa oh, and bit okay. the dog, the neighbor's okay. dog in the yard, okay? So um, the reason why this is simple is because of the methodology that we use, okay? So when uh, in the dog training world, e-collar gets a bad rap, uh, people will say like trainers like myself are lazy because we're jumping to like the easy way out or whatever and uh, or they say like you're shocking your dog which is incorrect because it's not electrocution um, the reason why I use e-collar is because right off the bat I have off leash control okay that's something we're interested in right that's another the thing off leash control yeah, yeah because we, we that's don't actually let... a plan <laughs> he used to be super reactive we don't let him off leash oh. Hardly ever, but we do go up to, we have a place up in Wisconsin and we'll take them on trails and if there's no one around, we'll mm -hmm. let them off, but we don't feel 100% secure that. I want him to be able to come back. Come. Yeah, and recall. even like at the mm -hmm. dog park, if I call him or if he sees me walking toward him, he'll... he'll Walk move. away. Yeah, because he doesn't yeah. want to leave. He yes. knows that. So I have to kind of be strategic and catch him when he's playing sure. near with somebody. recall I don't care if your dog is chasing a squirrel I don't yeah. care if he's playing with 10 dogs mm -hmm. he's going to come back to you okay, okay? we train for reality we want. yes we <laughs> train for reality okay? okay so the issue with other methods food prong collar gentle leader mm -hmm. harness what have you mm -hmm. is if you're using food if your dog uh, dog is doing something of greater value he's going to continue doing that okay, okay? Yeah. He's not very food motivated. Or we have no food motivation. Yeah. Okay, little yeah. to no food motivation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he'll eat it, but he'll like eat it and, not, and immediately go back, go back. to it. Yeah. Yeah. If we use prong collar, which is the spiky looking yeah. one, a uh, uh, gentle leader or like a no pull harness, yeah. the moment you take the leash off, your dog understands you no longer have any kind of physical control. Okay. With e-collar, on or off leash, at the press of a button, I have the ability to communicate with my dog. Okay. So right off the bat, we have off-leash control, um, and I can help build you guys to build off-leash uh, reliability and all that stuff. So to give you an example, I had a client who had um, a reactive dog. Uh, they had the first class, and the second class got pushed back a week because they were like out of town or something. But in, the, in between the first and second class, they were at Treps Park, which is not far from here. They're actually my neighbors, literally across the hallway. <laughs> um, they're at the park with their dog, like 6 a.m., not anticipating anybody to be there. There's a neighborhood nemesis. Mm -hmm. Neighborhood nemesis just happened to walk into the park while they were there with their dog off leash, okay? The dog started running towards their dog. Their dog started running towards that dog. In the moment, they just had one class. The dad just hiked up the collar to like 80 or something, pressed the button. Their dog stopped and ran right back to them, allowing the wife to go and intercept the other dog, okay? Right. We did no recall or anything, okay? So what happened there is that wasn't a recall. The dog started taking off. They hiked it up to a much higher number. That, so our numbers, our level, our e-collar caps at 127. That one caps at 100. Um, went to like 80, so like three quarters of the power, right? And told the dog, you're not gonna do that. So the dog built off of what it knew, which was leash walking and came back to the owner, okay? But then allowed them to just prevent the problem, okay? They said if that hadn't happened, they would have guaranteed been a, a dog fight, okay? So right off the bat, they had the ability to stop their dog, even though we hadn't done recall, okay? so. Uh, that's one e reason. The other reason is 
it's very effective, it's very efficient, okay? It's very easy to learn. So you guys aren't dog trainers, you're dog owners. You want something that's gonna work, uh, but doesn't require you to become a dog trainer in order for to understand it, right? Uh, it's very simple, okay? It's very common sense, logic-based, and I break everything down for you and I coach you, coach you through it real time. You show up with your dog, you have your equipment on, and I walk you through everything uh, verbally, okay? I don't need to touch your dog. So for you, it's all hands-on. It's like when I get my clients to have leash reactivity, um, if it were to happen, this is where we train, if it were to happen here, I coach them through it. Even if it's on the first class, I just walk them through it, okay? And then when they leave, they're like, okay, well, I can take this and just do this on my own because I did this with Jesse now. Does that make sense? Yeah. So most training is um, the trainer takes the dog, shows you, and then you take the dog back. The problem with that in e-collar is that if I do all the hard work, all the hard work's tied to me. Yeah. And then when I give the dog back, you will notice the dog is easier, but it's still tied to me. When you do it yourself, the dog goes, okay, mom and dad, like, this is them, right? If you work them through it, if you correct them for being reactive or what have you, your dog thinks it's tied to you, okay? And that's what's super important because I want your dog to know to behave with you. I don't care about with me. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. So, so when you have your board and because I know you also do like a board and train, train mm -hmm. how does that is that for cases that are really hard or like how does that? It's actually for cases that are easier. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you can do a board and train. Okay. I would recommend that you do in person. Okay. Okay. The reason is is because we have a behavior, mm -hmm. and you need to understand how to address the behavior. Okay. okay? When we do a board and train. It's nice because we get all the work done, all the obedience stuff, right? We cannot, however, recreate territorial behavior. Right. And a lot of times we don't even see it because when we come in, it's already structured. Like I mentioned earlier, it's a quiet kennel, right? So uh, we give the dog back, right? <clears throat> you would get videos to watch and review so that you can learn what the dog learned, okay? And then you have your follow-up lessons. In some cases, when the owner does a board and train, they're like, hey, Jesse, I get the obedience stuff. Everything's going great, but I have problem with reactivity or I have problem with territorial behavior. So then we use the lessons for that. So we might as well just do it from the beginning. Yeah, so uh, the, the con to in-person is it takes longer, but the pro is you learn so much more. And it's all you, okay? So when you go off for the week and you practice, and you come back and you have your successes and you have your failures, we will talk about it. And we'll review the failures, um, how to address them, you go off, another week rinse and repeat you come back you're like hey Jesse everything you said worked we're making great progress you go, excellent so you're learning how all this stuff works yourself as opposed to dropping your dog off picking them up as a finished product right and then trying to catch up to your dog does that make sense yeah. whereas here you guys are learning on the same uh, same uh, level and, and, and speed okay the pro of a boarding train is I can get obedience done in a short amount of time uh, the con to it, of course, is that I have to one transfer the obedience to you, but then also catch you up to what your dog learned has learned, and then also teach you how to address the behaviors. Okay, um, so like if this was strictly obedience and none of the behavioral stuff, I would say for sure board and train no problem. Okay, because it's just obedience. Uh, but because of the behavior stuff, I'm a very big advocate for the owner needs to understand and know how to address these things. Because once I'm not in the picture, what's it going to mean then? Okay. Yeah. So, and you can always, you know, talk about it, decide on it later on, uh, but I will give you options, okay? Uh, questions on any of that? Not on that. I, my big question about using the e-collar is how long yeah. does a typical dog need to keep using the e-collar? Mm -hmm. Is it something you have on for years or months until the training's over? Right, right. What's, so, what's that is one of the most common questions yeah. we get. It's a very sure. good question. Um, easiest way to explain it would be, do you guys drive? Do you go in the expressway? Do you go the speed limit? Okay. Most people don't, right? You see a squad car, what happens? Don't put an e-collar on me. <laughs> <laughs> you see a squad car, what happens? Yeah. You, you, you slow down. down. Right. You pass the squad car, what happens? Uh, you panic. <laughs> you get pulled over, potentially. <laughs> so, um, think of the e-collar as a cop on a collar. Uh -huh. When it's present, your dog will behave better because there is threat of consequence, right. okay? Uh, this is nothing good or bad. Uh, this has nothing to do with the, the, the training or my skills as a trainer. This is what's called opportunistic behavior, okay? Uh, if your dog can perform the behavior and get away from it with no consequence, why not, okay? 
humans are the same thing too. So um, think of it as when you need it, you have it. When your dog is in the yard, probably gonna have it, okay? When you're out on the walk, you're gonna have it. If you're at the park and he's playing with his dog friends, you're gonna have it. If he's a great dog inside the house, you don't have it, okay? So in the beginning, you may find you're using it more often than not because you're in the training phase, okay? But as you start to notice like his behavior is improving like in, in the house or what have you and potentially even in the yard, then you start to kind of wean it away in those contexts. However, whenever you're out on the walk with him or whenever you're gonna, he's gonna be off leash, the collar would be present. But it's not that you're always using it. It's simply present in case something happens. Sure. So for example, I had a client who was at this park. She had already completed her training. This was like months after her training. She was playing fetch with her dog, okay, like in a little section of the park by herself. This guy decided, <laughs> yep, bring him in. Oh, careful. So what you're gonna do is go ahead and bring him back. And instead of trying to pull him away, what you're gonna do is you're gonna pull straight up. So go ahead and pull up here. Pull up. And then you can scoot his butt over, close. There we go, and now relax, okay? When we pull away, you actually escalate reactivity. When you pull up, you de-escalate, okay? Now the other thing is uh, harnesses actually promote and provoke reactivity. So up, yep, bring him in, hold. Now turn around, yep and then turn him around and you're gonna pull up and then press down on his hindquarters. Like that, and now relax. Very good, okay? Up the escalates, back and up and back escalate, okay? With the harness, because the pressure's on the front of the chest, I know he has a no pull here. Yeah. Um, to me, a no pull harness is an oxymoron because harnesses are meant for pulling. Right. But what happens is the dog feels tension against the chest right. and that creates more frustration, okay? So it's like, in the, if you've ever seen a movie, where they hold a person back and the person's freaking out, it's the same concept, okay? So what do you recommend? He would be on his simple flat collar and then the remote collar, and then with the training, it wouldn't even matter, okay? okay? For now, you use what you have, uh -huh. but just get used to pulling up as opposed to pulling back. And instead of trying to move him away from it, because that's like a 40, 50 feet away, he's more than capable of handling that, right? Okay. So if I just anchor myself and I go, nope, you're not gonna do that, and I pull up and I sit him down, I'm just telling him to relax. Notice we didn't say sit. Right? We just said, nope, you're not going to do that uh, through physical touch. Does okay. that make sense? So saying sit is not a good thing. Because it's not about sit. Okay. It's about don't do that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, his, his trigger word for not doing something is we've always said leave, 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 leave it. it. Mm -hmm. Is that okay for just For now. Leave it. Uh -huh. But once, yeah. you know, should you move forward to the training, everything's by default. Okay. I want him to see a dog and not be reactive. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't want to have to say anything. It's expected that he's not reactive. Right. Okay. Um, so going back to the question, uh, so here, pull up and then push down because he moved forward. Oh, okay. You see that? So he still, he didn't let that dog go yeah. quite yet. All right. So um, so it's not that you're always having to use it. If you follow my instructions, you do the training as instructed, um, you will find the need to press the button is like once in the blue moon. Mm -hmm. It's simply there just in case. Oh yeah, so my example. So the, my client was here playing mm -hmm. fetch. Um, this guy invited himself into the fetch session with her dog his dog and her dog went for the ball at the same time, dog fight, okay? She had to cap her collar at 127 and continuous her dog, which is the harshest correction you can give, but her dog 180 out of the fight and returned right to her, okay? And she called me and she was crying and she's like, Jesse, my dog yelped, I felt bad, this and that. And I said, yeah, but it was either that or a dog fight, which who knows what would have happened. And I asked her, I was like, what happened? And she's like, well, I 127 continuous and she ran right out and ran straight to me. I said, that's exactly how that should work, okay? So in that moment, again, caught off guard, was not planning for that, was minding her business. Somebody decided to invite themselves there, okay? So in moments where we lose control, we have the ability to regain control because unfortunately we cannot account for life, okay? So with e-collar, again, it's just present just in case and you have it with you. But if your dog is responding to all the commands and stuff, you're not using it. It's just there just in case, okay? Um, so, so theoretically, it's always present when you're gonna be needing to use it or when you think you may need to use it. And when the dog is not gonna need it, then you just don't have it, okay? Um, other questions? So this shaking, yep. I mean, we see that as that he's anxious yep. in this, these situations. 100%, yep. Is there anything we can do? Yes and no. So we may find with the training, because e uh, anxiety is a stress response, mm -hmm. e-collar is a stressor, okay? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, uh, don't be surprised if you see an incline in stress and anxiety, okay? The difference is, when we do this, 
he's going to go under stress, we're going to work him through it, okay? And he's going to learn how to handle it better, okay? So when you use physicality with the dog, which we're taught is wrong, we're taught that's bad, okay? e call is technically physicality because it contracts the muscle, is that actually is what toughens up dogs. Dogs nip and bite each other. That is how they communicate, okay? Uh, puppies, as young as three to four weeks uh, in the litter, start to dominate and nip and bite each other to establish a hierarchy, okay? So when we get them at two months, what happens is we pull them out of the litter. They're now in a home with humans that don't do that. And if there's any kind of behavioral issue, they don't toughen up. They actually get weaker. They don't know how to handle things, okay? And then we start to see things like anxiety like this. We're just outside. Like, what is there to be anxious about, right? So when we get the e-collar and we start training, we'll see the incline because his anxiety is a stress response. But once the dog learns like, hey, I can handle this, I can take it, I can actually tolerate more than I think I can, this may start to go away, okay? Now, uh, I have another case similar, very whiny, okay? Like the entire time whiny. I actually posted a video up, the, uh, it's a recent video. Okay. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see it's called the Creating Calmness with E-Collar, and it's like a pit bull mis mixed dog, and you see her whining, and you see, it's like an eight minute video, and at the end of the class, the owner says, wow, or the, or the video, the owner says, wow, I've never had my dog be this quiet for this long outside before, okay? And we did it through the E-Collar, okay? So, uh, it may go away on its own, it may go away through us being proactive up on the leash and down on the butt. Very good. Um, or it may become, it may come to where he's anxious, he's just not as anxious, okay? Unfortunately, your dog ge is genetically wired this way, okay? Um, there is stuff that we can do, but there is no guarantee that we can rid this, mm -hmm. okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I mean, if that's how he is, that's how he is. I mean, you just, yeah, just, just feel bad for him more than yeah. No, 100%, well, I mean, and I agree. Do this when we get in the car, sometimes we'll get in the car and go somewhere. And he's like and this. And he'll shake like this for five minutes. Yeah. Until and that we can address. Then he sort of relaxes yeah. and sits down and he's fine. Up on your leash, down on the butt. Yeah, so uh, it, this it would also be on my to-do list okay. when working with you guys, okay? okay? Um, but there's just no guarantee that we can get him to full calmness. Right. You may see he's just less anxious, yeah. uh, or you may see it go completely. Every case is different, okay? I but mean, we don't know what happened in his first. We know he was uh, in a litter and they were rescued at five weeks. Mm -hmm. So for five weeks they lived under a house. They, mm -hmm. A friend of my daughter's tried to rescue them, and the mom kept moving the puppies. And sure. They were outside. So for five weeks, you know. So I don't know what happened to him during those five weeks. Sure. But he's been like this, shaky like this since, since they got him. Yeah, that to me is genetics. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, if this was like you had him for a year, and then like maybe he was attacked by an off-leash dog, and then after that this happened, which I've seen before, it'd be very easy to pinpoint where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Okay. To me, this is genetics. Yeah. So, uh, other questions? Um, no, you do all the training here, right? Yes, so this is Oz Park. This mm -hmm. is the busiest park in Chicago, okay? This right now isn't that, this is like 10% of what it usually yeah. is, yeah. but you come on a weekend and man, it is busy, okay? Yeah. Um, clients love training here just because there's so much distraction and stuff that they're in the middle of it and we're able to work through things real time. Plus, you know, if we're doing like recall training, you're in an distracting environment. So when you go to practice on your own, um, you know, you already have a baseline of what it's going to be like. Okay. Um, I do do home to home, but it's more expensive now because of now people. So I, before COVID, I used to travel to all my clients. I've been to Lombard. I've been to Hoffman Estates with uh, Wilmette, uh, Winnetka, Evanston, uh, Tinley Park, uh, Moreno. I've been all over Illinois, Indiana. Uh, and then COVID happened and nobody wanted me to come over anymore. Sure. Okay, so I had to come up with the middle ground and then I was like, okay, we'll train outside of the park, right? Mm -hmm. And it was so popular and people loved it so much that we've just kept with it mm -hmm. because of the environment, how distracting it is mm -hmm. and then the value that it just provides the client, yeah. okay? Um, so, so, yes, all the training is here. If it's like inclement weather, I do have my facility which is located west of the West Loop. Um, then we can train there if needed. During the winter time, I train out of my facility. <laughs> Uh, but uh, in some cases, we may push the client back if I know they absolutely need to be outside. But I try not to because my schedule gets so booked up sure. that I'll fall behind. Okay. Other questions? How long do you typically work with a dog with his, you know, based Forever. on what you know? Forever. <laughs> give me all your money. No, no, based no. Based on what you know now. So I would give you, so um, you have three choices in my mind. 
okay? And I'll, and I'll explain what we can uh, really, realistically expect to get done within the time frame, okay? So I have three, six, nine, and 12 week programs, one hour a week, uh, once a week, okay? Uh, I would put you at minimum six, and then if you wanted, up to 12, okay? If you did six, I would bare bones this, meaning I would target what I know you absolutely need. I'm not gonna teach anything that I don't think is gonna be useful to you, okay? I always prioritize behavior first, because that's what the liability is, right? right? So the first two classes are always on heel, which is leash walking, okay? The reason why this is, is a leash pulling and leash reactivity are the two most common things that people want to address, and the heel exercise helps fix those, fix those programs, okay? It is all, also the baseline of building uh, an e-collar foundation, okay? Most dogs, uh, or most people walk their dogs three times a day, seven days a week, okay? That's three times a day, seven days a week, you get to practice and reinforce this training, which helps your dog. When we're doing e-collar, remember it's a stressor, people tend to want to do less of it. And if, we try to get, if we're trying to get a dog over it, you need more of it, okay? So the healing exercise allows you to expose your dog to it three times a day, but then, so the e-collar is a stressor, but walking is a, uh, is a, is a uh, helps release, relieve the stress. So they help kind of counter each other, okay? So I get some dogs on the first class, they're shaking like a leaf, and they come back to third or fourth class, and they're completely fine, because now they know what the e-collar is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, also for a dog like yours, obviously with this anxiety and stuff, it's a ritualistic thing that you have to be physical with him to help toughen him up, to build that confidence, okay? So e the heel exercise takes about two classes, okay? You show up with your dog, uh, I coach you through everything, I teach you everything, give you your homework, you come back class two, you give me feedback, make some adjustments, work on the second half of heel, go back, do your homework, come back class three, okay, how's he been in the yard, right? Oh, he's been less reactive. Uh, he's been he's been a bit calmer. He's not barking at his neighbors as much. Nothing's changed. You let me know, okay? From there, I then address the issue, okay? And I teach you how to correct him in the yard for the barking, how to stop the territorial behavior, how to address it, control it, harness it. Um, if there's any leash reactivity, how to correct it, uh, and then you go off to do your homework, okay? You come back class four again, feedback, okay? If you're feeling confident, you're like, hey Jesse, like what you said worked. We're making progress, we're feeling good, we're having control. I go, great, would you like to work on recall? Yeah, then we work on recall, okay? You come back to the next class, give me more feedback, okay? So I won't really move to the next thing unless I know we're good, okay? In some cases, let's say you're struggling with the yard stuff, yes. okay? And you email me and say, hey Jesse, we're supposed to have training in two days, but we're having an issue with the yard stuff. I would probably tell you, push the next class, try this instead, and I would email you an answer, okay? okay? Because for me, especially if the importance is the behavior, there's no reason to go to the next thing if we're still working on the current thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So like I've had clients, or I have clients that are have leash reactivity. I had one client who took a month where I didn't see them. I was just all email, just working through things. And then finally, we found the answer. And I said, give it another two weeks before you book your next class, because we want to make sure that this answer is sinking in. And it did. And I said, okay, cool, now book your fourth class. Okay, because if they come back and they want to review it again, it's the same stuff. Yeah. There's, like once you understand it, it's what about this is gonna work. And almost always it's just raising the intensity of the collar. Okay, but you only have so many opportunities to do that within a day. Okay, so, uh, so if that were to happen, you would communicate to me, hey Jesse, we're still having issues here. I'd email you back, try this instead, push your class back. Okay, and then once we've got it done, Okay, now cool, let's, let's have the recall class or whatever it is, okay? You have your recall class, <clears throat> and then the, the length of the program is really determined on how long does it take to address the behavior and how much control do you want over your dog, okay? The more you want your dog to be able to do obedience-wise, the longer the program, the more difficult the behavior is that I'm dealing with, the longer the program, okay? I don't find this to be difficult, okay? I find this to be like a moderate case um, because it was all contextual, it's all territorial, okay? There is no issue at the dog park, there is no issue at the dog daycare, okay? So all that tells me this is a fixed context, and once we address that context, theoretically, we shouldn't see the problem anymore, okay? So, um, if you wanna be able to take your dog to a restaurant, and he hangs out and chills out, and he's there laying at your feet while you enjoy a nice dinner or a brunch, uh, that would require you know, a class or two to teach that skill. Um, if you want him to learn like all the obedience plans, so there's six, Sit, stay, down, come, place, heel. Good job. 
Um, if you want your dog to learn all six commands and to be able to have all six commands to an off-leash level, now we're looking at like a nine to 12 week program, okay? Um, if you did a nine week program, um, the way I go about it is a little bit different because I'm trying to plan out, okay, we want off-leash obedience, but at the same time, we also want behaviors to be addressed, right? So in the beginning, I try to cover all the obedience stuff while tackling the behavior. And towards the eighth, seventh to eighth class, I'll, you'll have everything you need to know in order to build the obedience to a higher level. But what you need now is time, okay? So I might tell you, hey, you know, you have recall, you have stay, you have heal. Uh, we can build this to an off-leash level, but you need to space out your classes because you need time to go, train, make mistakes, you know, come back, hey, Jesse, this is where we're at. I hope you fix it. You take more time to do that stuff, right? Same thing with the 12 class program. But a 12 class program, we're covering all the commands. Sit, stay, down, come, place, heal, okay? And building all six commands to an off-leash level. And then the behavior stuff. So it really just comes down to, do you want all the commands to be off-leash? Or do you want just the recall and maybe the heal to be off-leash? That is what affects the length of the program. So could we, could we uh, potentially like start with a six week? Like, can you sign up for six week and then in the middle say, hey, we're really thinking we would like to do more than that and then like switch over? Or is that hard you can, for you to do? But we just don't prorate the program. No, no, no. I mm -hmm. Yeah, you can absolutely okay. do that. The reason why we don't do that is uh, my calendar is, is pre-booked, right? So let's say, for example, you did six classes. And let's say Monday at 4 o'clock worked for you. Uh -huh. And you chose that time. Monday for six weeks plus one at 4 o'clock is your time. No one can take it from you, okay? Unless I have, like, a previous client that scheduled another, a single class or whatever. But it won't count against you. Um, is if it's like, hey, this is going great. We want to book another six classes. You would technically have to go back in line again. I see because we have other clients that are booking. And uh, did you go through Tina or Maria for the, the, the booking? Tina. Tina? So for Tina, she looks at it and she goes, okay, Jesse is gonna be free at four on Mondays on this particular date, right? So if another client wants that date, it may get booked. So when you come back, you may not even get the same time because she already booked somebody else right, at that right. time. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. So that's, that's primarily why. Uh, if you book nine, uh, you get a cheaper per class rate because you're saying up front, hey, I'm committed to at least nine, okay? Um, you don't always have to use the full program. So I get clients, like I've had clients do like first six classes and they'll take like the uh, fall winter season off and they'll come back in the spring, summer the following year, okay? okay? I get other clients that, like I mentioned earlier, will book um, like a month between the final classes to give them time to, uh, to do the training and stuff. It, it's not really set in stone that you have to do nine in a row. It's like, okay, I wanted the cheaper per class rate. Right. I want more obedience, but at the same time, I want time to get stuff done. Because right, right. once you have everything, it's a lot. Right. It's a lot, you know, these things all stack. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, one other question was, do you, how do you feel about just scheduling can be an issue for us? Because our work hours are extremely different. Sure. So, like, how do you feel about having both people there both times? Are you okay if one of us could come and not the other? Like ideally, ideally both. Uh -huh. Not a big deal because as I mentioned earlier, we actually record the lessons yeah. now, okay? So what happens is, you know, you show up, if it's just one of you, no big deal. Uh, we do the training. I send the, the link to the video to you okay. so that the other person can That's view the right. video. That's very yeah. helpful. Yeah. In the summer, he, he travels in the summer. Yep. No worries. The other thing is, you could we have clients that are like, nurses and doctors okay. that are on a rotating schedule yeah. is that um, uh, they will just give us their schedule like let's say they know a month mm -hmm. and we'll plan accordingly so we don't meet at the same time sometimes they don't see them for a couple of weeks because the schedules don't line up which is not detrimental because it gives you more time to work on the stuff okay uh, so that's also a possibility so if you prefer like you both be here we just wouldn't see each other at a regular time yeah. so that the whole priority yeah, might be the best for us So then you just let us know, you know, yeah. uh, I don't, it's what the client wants, right? So if it's like, no, we want to get in we want to do week by week, then we'd have to just do that, right? But if it's like, no, we'd like to both be there, then you would just send us your calendar okay. and then we'll do our best okay. to, to, to book it. Once you have the first class, 
the, the next following classes don't matter that much. Okay. okay? Um, like I've had clients that would have the first class and immediately have a trip. And I would say, okay, well, just give yourself an additional week to catch up when you get back before you have your second class, you know? Um, yeah. But it's the, the, the methods that we use give us a little bit of gray area with this stuff, okay? And then you always have um, me as a resource via email. So during that time, if I don't see you for a couple of weeks, you can always ping me with an email with any kind of questions you may have. Yeah. Okay. We have a trip coming up at the end of the month, but we're not taking, we're not going to be with him for, okay. so for 10 days. So I'm kind of thinking we might want to start after, after that that's trip. What I was that's fine. Too, like yeah. In July. Mm -hmm. yeah. Completely up to you. comes like the scheduling stuff uh, easiest way to go about it is when you um, decide on a, a program length uh, so six is the minimum okay and more is perfectly fine he would let me read uh, Tina know hey we want to do the six week program um, here's our availability starting July okay so you're booking now but ahead of time because my calendar is gonna fill up right now uh, we're, we're still have the lull of like the winter into the spring yep. but like last week I had like six clients and like today I'm working till 8 30 8 30 and I was just back to back all day okay so I go from being empty to just booked up so you can book your future time now and then give her your uh, schedule if you have it and then she'll just start making spots for you guys okay um, and then she will send you a contract form uh, please read the contract. If you have any questions, please ask questions on the contract. Uh, but do keep in mind um, that we uh, only will keep the time for you once the contract is submitted and uh, we are paid, okay? Because what happens is clients will ask questions and then they're like, okay, we're ready. And I got booked up, yeah. you know? And it's, um, I don't, I'm not against it. People asking questions, but then we get flack because like, well, I thought Jesse had availability. Like he did, but yeah. then I got booked up while yeah. you, you were going back and forth. So, uh, Tina does go by the contract. Once that's submitted and uh, you have your dates down and you're paid, you're, you're in, okay? Um, and then as we go along with the program, as you know, you learn your, your calendar and everything, you would just email her and then she'll do her best to get you in regularly, okay? Um, and if there's some, something comes up, are we able to reschedule? Yes, so we, have, so we have a 48 hour uh, window. Okay. So as long as you cancel or reschedule outside of 48 hours, no problem. Okay. okay. That's uh, if you, up. there you go, over right there. Good job. Very good job. Um, if you cancel within 48 hours, good job. You got it. Um, we give everybody a last minute freebie cancellation because we understand things happen. You wake up, you're sick, work, what have you. Your dog is sick. Uh, so here, go ahead and pull him towards you, and then relax right there. Okay. Because you said you saw he had oh, kept that yeah, tension. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no. So always relaxation once you get what you want. It's okay. Um, if you cancel five hours before your class, within five hours, it just counts as a class. Because since I'm back to back, if you're at five and it's one o'clock, there's no way I'm filling right. that time frame. So I'm just right, here for right, an hour, right. okay? Yeah. But as long as you're, uh, you cancel within that 40 hours, you do get one freebie. Uh, if you cancel outside, not a problem, okay? Right. Other questions. And it's also in the contract as well. Questions? I guess the only other question is like the e collar, yes, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Tina will provide you with that information okay. Okay. as well as pricing. She'll send me an email. Correct. Okay. I would put your dog on the Dog to Black Edition, which, which is the best collar there is. It's the highest power collar there is. Okay. Uh, reason being, uh, it's meant for a 70 pound dog and over. Your dog is at 55, 60, right? So he's, he's close to it. Yeah. Also, the level of anxiety that we have. Okay. So, we, so I'd rather have it and not need it. There's also a collar that's 70 pounds and under, but again, he's right on that, just under that threshold, okay? So, um, it's nothing good or bad. I could put that black edition on my eight pound chihuahua. He would be perfectly fine. We get more from less, okay? So, 30 or 40 on the lower power e-collar might be 20, 25 on the high power e-collar is all it means, okay? Uh, she'll send you uh, the information on that. Now, currently we do have a promotion going on, just so you guys are aware. Uh, you get 5% of your program credited towards you, okay? And you can use this towards your e-collar purchase, okay? Uh, if you're gonna do that, uh, you would just let Tina know, hey, we're gonna use our credit. So once you've paid for your program, you then get the credit. 
Hey, Tina, please send us the invoice for the e-collar. Please apply our credit. She will discount it and then send you the invoice and you just pay the difference, okay? Um, and it, that's valid until June 30th. So it's a, so, <coughs> so then, not talking to you. Do you just bring the e-collar with you when, for the first lesson? <coughs> Goodbye. Yeah. So. Correct. Sorry, I've been talking since 10 o'clock. Right. Got it. <clears throat> so, yes, you show up. <clears throat> I will have sent you a link to a video to watch. <clears throat> I don't know how that feels. It's awful. <clears throat> to prepare you for the class. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, it's okay. I can feel it. <clears throat> um, ideally, I sent you a link to the video, if I remember. Uh, that you would review. You would do nothing with the training. Okay, you just watch the video to prep you. So that you come to class with a foundation. So we could just jump into the training. Okay. Um, if I forget, no big deal. <clears throat> I'll teach you everything in the class, but then I'll send you the link, and then it's, it just goes more in depth with, with the, uh, the exercises. Okay? Uh, other questions? Anything else? No. If, is there any reason we should, like, if we get back from our trip on July 8th? Eight, so, like, if we started soon after that, is there any reason, like, why that would be? bad for him nope. if that we've been gone or anything like that. Nope. Kind of like <laughs> I don't know. Nope. Okay. Dogs don't think like, that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Up. Oh. <laughs> yep, you got it. And then relax. Now here, just to point out, and this is why I don't think your case is bad, is you see how you're able to settle him down? <clears throat> and you have a harness which works against you. But the fact that you're able to settle him down, and uh, to me, this is requiring little work. I know it may feel like a lot because it's new well, it's to you. Just it makes me nervous because yeah. of what's happened. I'm nervous about But, that. like, the, 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 the case that I have, I actually had to go back to work with this case in my facility because it was so bad here that I said, let's make it easier on us and go to my facility. Yeah. It, was, it was challenging, okay? This here is pretty straightforward. Like, you're able to settle him down mm -hmm. with minimal effort even with a tool that's working against you. Okay. So that's why I'm like, this is not a bad case. Okay. She's, when you say the tool, you're talking about the harness, the yeah. chest harness? Correct. So if it were just on the, the collar, the collar it, it would be, be better. But that what happens at the easier. base of the neck, you still get that opposition reflex. Yeah. Which is why we use tools like prong collar or heat collar, because there's some kind of aversive to it. But for now, I wouldn't change anything. Sure. Just stick to what you have. Okay. Gotcha. okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, we just started on this because we were told that it was better for it's called a no pull harness, yeah. but harnesses are meant for pulling. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Horses yeah. were harnesses to pull yeah. carriages, huskies were harnesses yeah, to pull yeah, sleds. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, it makes sense. in the dog training world, there is a lot of divide. Uh, there's trainers like myself, and then there's the trainers that hate trainers like myself. Okay? And they will tell you, oh, you're shocking your dog, you're electrocuting your dog, you're torturing your dog to guilt you into not using these methods, but then the methods they use don't work. Yeah. That's where we did puppy training with him, and he was. I mean, he did all the classes. It was like an agility thing, uh -huh. and he could do everything, but he barked through the whole thing. They were wanted... strictly food-based. No, yeah. uh, only positive rewards. Yeah. Only positive reinforcement. No, no spray bottle. No, nothing. Yeah, there's there's theories where you can't even tell your dog no. I had a client who was in a puppy class, and the, the puppy like jumped on her, and she instinctively said no. They booted her out of class, <laughs> and kept her money. Can you believe that? Yeah, that's kind of the way they were yeah, at that point. I mean, yeah, yeah. We, he they kept were... putting us to the side. Like, he was like, oh, he's extremely reactive, and he'd take us out of the, no, no, no. like, wait here till his turn. Like, so we were, like, spending the whole time, and then I'd take him out, and he'd do the thing, and then we'd go back again. Mm -hmm. Because he was just barking at the other dogs. He wanted to play with them, yeah. and it was not very helpful. Yeah. <laughs> no, we got we're... through the class, but... I'm all about training for life. Okay. Like I want you to be able to walk your dog confidently, not worry about his behavior, and or if anything were to happen, the confidence to know that you're going to be able to regain control. Okay. okay. Um, other questions? I think I'm pretty good too. Yeah. Okay. So um, it was a pleasure meeting you guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah you too. Uh, Tina will follow up with the information. Uh, if you'd like to expedite things, you know, you're, you're welcome to email her. Say, hey, uh, Tina, I'm shifting to a new, a new I think admin. It's yeah. I'll, I'll check on the email.
um, is we'd like to start after July 8th, you know, maybe from the 10th point forward, what have you. Uh, if you happen to have your schedule, provide your schedule. Let her know, hey, we're not going to be able to do recurring because we would like to both be there. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, and then she'll, she'll plan accordingly. And then um, to save your spot, you don't have to pay in full, but uh, you can put a deposit of 50% of the program down, and then you can pay the rest before the start of your program, okay? Right. However, uh, we are paid in full before the program starts, yeah. okay? Uh, before we used to allow people to do payment plans, and then we found ourselves chasing people to get the money they owed us, and it was a problem. Yep. So, uh, but yeah, but you don't have to commit up front. You can do 50% just to hold your program, your, your time, your start time, and the dates and stuff. And then once we're ready to start, you'd be invoiced for the rest, and you pay it, and we get started, okay? Yep. And then uh, she will uh, address the e-collar stuff as well in terms of what uh, make a model. And then uh, uh, make sure to remind her, hey, Jesse told us about a promotion, credit, or whatever, uh, so she knows to apply it to sure. the program. Oh, I do have one other. Or question. not program, to the I'm caller. Sorry. I was just thinking, we, have, we do have a dog walker that comes like yep. once a week. Yep. So how do we, when we're in in the program, mm -hmm. how do we address that with her? Does she? If she's open to using the tool, uh, so I have another client uh, who has a dog walker. The dog walker happened to be open to using the collar. He sent him the link to the video. He was able to watch it. And then uh, the owner gave him a couple of things to, like, like, you know, to focus on. And then they reinforced it, okay? What's nice about this method of training is that it transfers very easily, pending they're operating at the correct number. Okay. That's what holds people back. Okay. So if the number is 40, uh -huh. but the dog walker goes, oh, I don't like 40, uh -huh. I want to be 20, it's That's not going to work. Gonna work. Okay. okay. Now, is there any harm if she doesn't? Nope. Like if she's coming once a week and she doesn't use nope. it? Nope, okay. because dogs learn by association. Yeah, yeah. So your she's dog... She's older, she's yeah, probably she's, not going to... she's probably not going to Sure, use completely it, fine. Uh, your dog would just learn that with you, He's expected to behave, and with her, he could probably get away with stuff. Yeah. Okay. Again, it's that opportunistic behavior. Yeah. It's what I call the grandparent effect. Uh -huh. If you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, other questions? I don't have anything. I think yeah, it's been you. very helpful, though. Right. Thanks. Well, it was a pleasure meeting you guys. Yeah. Likewise. If you have any questions, you let us know. Okay. If they pertain to me, Tina will email me. I'll email her an answer. She'll follow up with you. It, uh, otherwise, she can answer them yeah. for you. And then um, she'll help you guys get you situated. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thanks, Jesse. Take care. Thank you for coming down all this Thank way. You. Thank you.